Who are you? What do you do? And why should someone listen to you? My name is Tom Vossler. Uh, I'm originally from Eindhoven, where we are right now. Uh, I live in Amsterdam, um, where I um, did my master's, then found a job, then decided to quit my job about a year ago, so July last year. Um, and then I decided to stay there. So that's a bit of um, where I live. What I do for a living, what I do right now is um, I've created content on Instagram for students and students in a broader sense. So I help people from almost like 14 till 58. And what we actually teach them is scientifically proven learning methods, uh, time management techniques, mindfulness, mindset, um, to help them succeed in their studies without having all the study pressure that a lot of students experience. And um, yeah, basically I got that idea and maybe that's one of your question because I was self, uh, myself a failing student, learned how to learn, aced it. And the last question before I'll give the word back is um, why should someone listen to me? I always say like, listen to what my students say about that. But since they're not here, I will just quickly share. Like, I think uh, I work with a topic and a target audience that's often, um, left behind in business because they are known for a group that don't have big budgets. Um, and so therefore a lot of people switch in the productivity niche to people who are working to companies, etc. So I think, uh, it's important to also speak to the students. They have a lot of study pressure. They have a lot of mental health issues and we are helping them with that, uh, with that. So, um, I think that's why why people should listen to what I have to say. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a content creator, an entrepreneur, a coach? All three? No. I'm going to be honest. I, I would say my biggest thing is coaching. And to be honest, I... I do the Instagram and all the content creation because that's how we reach people these days. And the moment I can even outsource that more, I will do it because I just want to have the conversations with the students, help them as much as possible. Hmm. Makes sense. So then you thought first of the business and then you thought, okay, how can I get the people? And then you went, okay, Instagram. Yeah. Why Instagram? Oh, well, long story short, I started my business in 2022. So I figured out after my master's that I had knowledge about the scientifically proven learning methods, about productivity skills um, that helped me to ace my master's while still on a student representative board while doing extracurricular activities. And I didn't experience that much stress. And then I learned about entrepreneurship. So I thought, hmm, let's combine these two and see what I can do. And then half a year later, I found a well course online from Rob Dial. I'm not sure if you know him, the mindset mentor. Uh, he's, uh, he's pretty big. And he said like, okay, if you're a starting entrepreneur and you want to learn how to coach people, and I was like, that's what I want to do, then join us. He advised to start on Instagram. That's when we started like May, 2023 and, um, yeah, now we're now we're here where we're at, two hundred forty thousand followers, uh, lots of clients. So it's pretty amazing. So you started it in May, twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah, September twenty twenty two. I signed up. Uh, I was brainstorming for half a year. I was talking to a lot of people. I was talking to students, figuring out what the problems were, talking to people in my network, like teachers. What did they see? happening uh, at the educational space, they said, this is a huge market. Like you, you got something in here. And then I found Rob, who's actually going to tell me, this is how you promote yourself. So market yourself. This is how you're going to sell your services. And this is how you're going to make a living. I joined that course two months and I decided to quit my job and go for it. Did you make any money before quitting your job or was it like a bold move? I'm just yeah. going to believe in myself. Yeah. I had, um, I had about 8,000 euros in savings. So I said to myself, okay, I got 8,000. I made some calculations. I spend about 12, 1300 euros a month, max on my rent, groceries, sometimes doing some fun activities, going to be strict on my budget. And I'm just going to give myself six months to make this work. And 
eventually it worked. So what was the feeling when you made your first sale online, your first online money, let's say? It was pretty exciting, but it was also really amazing because like before I made my first sale, I had like 15, 20 no sales, right? You get into this, you're going to talk to students that you're going to start with. Yeah, I'm going to charge you 1500 euros for three months. And students are like, yeah, I can't pay that. And I hear that every time, every time. And then the first one said yes to, uh, I think, 1,200 euros. And I was like, okay, this is amazing. We got this going. There's a market for it. There's students that we can help. And uh, yeah, the first client was also one of my, I think, also my best ones that I've ever worked with. Like she was into it. I was into it. Got it sorted. So That's interesting because yeah. I'm actually in the same, I live on the same journey right now. I feel like I have something going on that can be better than staying where I'm at. And my thought behind my head is, what's the worst that can happen? I can always rely on a job and go back to working nine to five. How did that process go in your head and about coming to the decision like, yeah, I'm just gonna do it? Yeah. Well, you started this conversation behind the scenes with saying that you quit your job last week. So it's pretty awesome. And, um, I think the belief came from the support and the, the mentors that I had. So just simply working with someone who literally told me like, do this. And if you put in the work, the results are going to come. And me knowing myself is okay. If I get into something, I'm doing it 110%. Like there's no way that I'm going to half ass this program. Like I invested almost 7,000 euros into it. So I said, I'm going to make the most out of this. And then having the support from them, well, being coached by someone who's called the mindset mentor will tell you a thing or two about your, your mindset. So that helped me a lot, like the belief in myself, like just continuously going uh, and the support. So I think that is a big part of why I succeeded is my mindset, my drive, but definitely the support I got from people around me. Yeah. But you did, so you did this coaching, the mindset, um, what was the name? The mindset coach mm -hmm. program yeah. six months before starting your business. Uh, six months after. Six months after. Yeah. yeah. And six months before starting your business in May, you were thinking or, of what yeah, are the yeah. problems and the ideas. Exactly. Exactly. And then what was the reason behind you wanting to start your own business and not just going with life and working for someone else? That's a very good question. So when I was doing my master's, um, I went to a private business university. I got a scholarship. I took out some extra student loan and I said, okay, I'm going to invest a lot of money in this uh, university. And there I surrounded myself with a lot of people who come from very wealthy backgrounds, right? So they are uh, kids from the top 1% in the Netherlands earners. And I come from a, I would say a normal, yeah. well, also above average family, I would say, but not like, okay, here you have 30 grand, uh, live in Amsterdam, everything like, so I surrounded myself with a lot of people and, um, that really gave me insights about investing and starting businesses and working for yourself. A lot of people were doing freelance jobs on the side, already making uh, additional uh, money. Uh, and I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. Like I want to do something for myself. I don't really like it when people tell me what to do when I think I have a different perspective on something. And um, I had some courses about entrepreneurship learned a lot about that and then thought, okay, let's put everything that I've learned into practice with my own ID. And then, yeah, everything fell together. How much did networking play a role into that, into where you are right now? I would say quite, quite a lot. I think, uh, still the people that I talk to. So some of my old teachers, they still invite me for like events at the, at the university. They're like, hey, Tom, do you want to assist us? Do you want to help us? 
uh, I got this contact for you. He has a podcast YouTube studio in Amsterdam. Like, feel free to reach out to him. Feel free to uh, reach out to this person. And with network, yeah, opportunities come. And then it's up to you if you make use of it, if it's the right time. And then, yeah, go forward. So that's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. After how many months did the first sale come in of you going full time on the business? I think that month. So I started in May with the program. I decided to quit my job end of May. Then I had to work the whole of June, like your one month, yeah. last last month kind of thing. And then I think I had my first client at the end of June or in the first weeks of July, just when I was starting with everything. Yeah. The Instagram account that you right now have with 250,000 followers back then in May. Yeah, May 2023. And how many followers did you have when you made your first sale? I think 300. 300 followers. followers. That's crazy. That's... Yeah. People think that you actually need to have a lot of following in order to be able to make money. I know people who have 6K followers and make 50, 60,000 a month. How? Just by selling courses and selling... Selling uh, the, right, uh, the right product and services, yeah. I know people who sell product services three months for 7,000, 7,500. So then you're talking about 2,500 a month. Do that times 10, times 20. And then you're, you're at 50K. So, so now you're an entrepreneur. You, don't, you work for yourself. Yeah. Do you take days off? Uh, well, today is usually... My Saturday afternoons are off, my Sunday mornings are off, but since I work with students from all over the world, I had to adjust my schedule, right? I can't only work at uh, Monday to Friday because I also think that's why we decide to do something for ourselves to, to figure that out. Um, and, and therefore, for example, my Sunday evenings, I work with all my American students because they are six hours behind. Yeah. For me, it's evening, for them it's throughout the day. It works. Um, I take my Wednesdays off, just the middle of the week. I take a whole day off. If I want to do something for work, I will do two, three hours. But if I don't want to do anything, I'll just go ride my motorbike, go to the gym, and maybe read a book in the sun if the weather is nice, you know? Does it feel like working or? Sometimes, yes, sometimes. Yeah? Not. When like, I have to do the annoying things. Yeah, taxes, paperwork. Taxes, paperwork. Um, also, something that I don't necessarily like is indeed all the content thing. Like You don't like the content part? No, I want to help people. I want to, hmm. like, I can talk, for example, with you for hours, uh, coach you, help you. That's what I want. And, like, the content is just part of the... The marketing. The marketing and the strategy. And, and how do you do it then? Do it at the beginning of the week so that I don't have to think about it for the rest of the week. So, yeah. Um, I got... I got a video editor for Instagram. So basically what I do is at the beginning of the week, I schedule like two hours um, and be like, okay, this is inspiration. I got, uh, we make that in my own brand voice, in my own videos, he's going to edit it. And then my social media manager, uh, she's going to post it and schedule it. So, so that takes me like two to four hours on a Monday and then I'm done for a whole week. So you're not really fixated on, on the numbers on the account, like, oh, this video didn't do good, this video did amazing. Well, of course we look at what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we also look at our surrounding, like, hey, what works well for them? Are there any trends? Of course, like we have to keep that in mind because from the following, also the opportunities for more clients come, right? That's a numbers, numbers game eventually. But I think if you have your systems in place, indeed, like you don't have to necessarily have a big following to start with something, you know, like you just have to get started, have a proven system that works. And from there it goes, like it even makes it difficult that we have that many followers to make more accurate sales. So is there a lot of people reaching out? I want, I need the help. Or is there just like, oh, I follow this guy because he gives free information on how to study. What's the conversion rate on people that actually re end up reaching out? 
So there's a ton of people that want the help. There's a ton of people that can't afford it. So that's something that I accept as indeed me working with students. So we are continuously thinking about, okay, how can we provide free value to a certain extent? How can we provide a budget, student budget friendly value? And how can we provide a high service value? But always with the goal that we get them from being a failing student to a passing student. That's, that's the main goal. And they decide where and which bucket they eventually want to end up and how much they can invest in themselves, etc. Do you think that the education system is structured right now affects how people are learning? That's a very good question. In my opinion, the educational system itself is not developed to teach people the right skills to succeed in the educational system. So what do we do from when we are four till when we are uh, 20? We're spending about 13,000 hours at school in total and zero of these hours on average because before people are going to be like, oh no, I got that in class, okay. On average, maybe one or two hours in their whole life are spent on one, I will teach you how you can learn because that's what we have to do the whole day. Yeah. I will teach you how to manage your time properly such that you can have a job next to your work or next, you can have a job next to your school. You can have a social life. You can still succeed in your studies. Besides that, how to go along with the study pressure? 97% of students experience stress with study pressure as the main cause. Teach them how to deal with it. No, we don't. We have one study coach for 1,300 students. And if they have a problem, they have to wait in line for two weeks before they can have a conversation. So I'm like, okay, we need to teach them these skills because that will make everything else so much easier. But then it's also the willingness of the students if they want to apply it, implement it, etc. But yeah, I think if we can make that shift, there's a lot of more students who can improve their mental and physical health um, while they are just succeeding in their studies and therefore also more in life. Yeah, there's uh, this one guy, uh, Simon Squibb, I think he's called. Squibb? Squibb. Squibb, I don't know. Yeah. He's uh, an entrepreneur and he says that the educational system is broken mm -hmm. because they j just teach you to work, 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 learn, work. How do you, how can you, for example, refute that argument that is just work, 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 but that there's actually more. Basically, he says that they don't teach you to be an entrepreneur or to actually do something that you're happy with, just continue study, because that's what people do, get a master, because that's what people do nowadays, and then go to work, yeah. and that's life until you're 65. Yeah. Can you imagine a world where everyone's an entrepreneur? No. We need doctors, right? We need people who build houses, we need people who work. So how are we going to create a system where everyone is an entrepreneur, or everyone is trying to live from online Wi-Fi money, etc. It's not going to happen. It's not. So we need, we need people in our society that just serve and Therefore, I think it is necessary that we have educational systems. Can they improve? Of course, but we can't, we can't create 8 billion entrepreneurs who are all going to somehow make money online and then, okay, let everyone die because there's no doctors in the hospitals, etc. Like that doesn't make sense, right? No, that, that makes sense. Never thought of that. I agree with the fact that, okay, let's teach people if they are ambitious and they want to start something for themselves, let's teach them uh, those skills. I fully agree. But on the other hand, like a lot of people, and I think uh, a lot of people are mistaken, that people like the comfort of just showing up every day, getting a paycheck. They don't worry too much and they like it. 
the reason why I decided to quit my job is because I found something that I'm just way more passionate about. And I enjoy working for myself. So it was a combination. I'm not earning thousands a month right now. I'm reinvesting everything in the company. I think I'm earning like half of what I made when I was a consultant. Yeah. But are you happier? Yeah. So that's what it's about, right? That's what it's about for me. But there's so many people who are happy with the thing that they're doing. A nurse is super happy if they can help the yeah, people. Save some they lives. Save some lives. So this other person is happy if he, he built a house. I don't know why he decided to build a house, but I hope he's happy that he's providing shelter for someone else. How do you think there in that concept does what your parents did or the expectations from your parents play a role? Yeah, I think this is a hard one to be honest, because my, to be honest, my parents never put any expectations on me. They just said, you should do whatever you uh, want as long as you're enjoying yourself. Right. So my mom said when I was 16, do your sports science bachelor. My dad said, oh, maybe go into accounting. Like you have higher chances of getting a job. I decided to do the sports science thing, enjoyed it to the fullest. When I was 20, I went to do my master's in an economic like business field. Listen to my dad, yeah. but it was more mature. So I enjoyed it more. I started my job as a consultant, thought I would enjoy it. I enjoyed it for eight months. It was, it was super cool, learned a lot. Something else came across which I also thought I would enjoy and explore and I'll do it. But a lot of people indeed have expectations from friends, family, etc. cetera. And um, it's hard to break away from that yeah. if you don't have that supportive system around you. Um, so I can't really share my experience based on that because I don't ever feel that my parents put any pressure or expectations on me. But what if, for example, a student comes to you and tells you, yeah, my surrounding is not the best for the studying. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my parents pay for everything I want, but they just want me to do this one thing and follow, for example, the company, the family business. Yeah. How do you approach a student like that? Yeah, that's a difficult question because it depends on so many factors. It's like, okay, what does the student want? That's my question. Like, hey, what do you want? And if they say that they don't want to continue with the family business, for example, we're going to have them have that conversation with their parents. And we can prepare that, like we'll do a mock conversation and we'll bring up the arguments that they have for why they don't want to continue with the uh, family business, for example. But of course, like I also can't force any, yeah, like broken relationships with friends, with with parents etc i'm not going to say like yeah like if you don't want that you should be really strong and say like i don't want that and like mess up their whole family system because that's not why i'm here i'm just here to say to them okay if you want to do something else might consider a conversation with them where you express your feelings your thoughts and what you do want and then see if they're open to it do you consider yourself to be because I can imagine that a student approaches you trying to come and learn better skills to study, improve their studying, but then it becomes a little bit more of a life coaching. Do you have that a lot that you need to actually end up doing some life coach to solve that first and then go into the study coaching? Yeah, what is life coaching? For example, my surround, like I'm just studying this, I don't know, I'm doing a bachelor in business because my parents want me to continue the family business and do that, mm -hmm. but I want to be an artist, yeah. an example, or a content creator yeah. or anything else, yeah. but do business. Yeah. Do you then just go and, yeah, let's uh, learn how to study for you to improve on business or do you actually go more about the life around that? Th that aspect yeah that's a that's a good question again um it's hard because i really like in in the beginning my conversation with students is also about what do you want and if i truly feel that they are doing a studies that they are also motivated and passionate about we don't have that conversation right so far 
I'm going to be honest, I never really experienced a very strong uh, situation like that. But what I often do have is indeed a student who's doing his studies right now, for example, doesn't enjoy the study and we want to make a shift. But usually the parents don't make a big deal of that as long as their kid is happy. So I, I never had it really strongly like, okay, I'm doing business because that's what people expect and I want to do something completely different. Um, so I find it hard, but we'll definitely look at the questions like, hey, okay, if you were going to do something else, what are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? What do you see yourself doing for the next like one to three years? I don't believe that we have to look at 10 year plans um, because everything can change in, in one year and then go for that and that's it like i wouldn't go in more depth like figuring out like okay why is it that your parents want that or why is it that you don't want it etc i can imagine that then you actually have a lot of people that they just suck at studying because they were never taught how to study and that they they are actually enjoying what they're studying mm -hmm. but then they just don't know how to or or they read a lot, read a lot, and then their grades are not as good as they thought. Because that happened to me. Yeah. And I think later on in life, I just figured out that it was not me not knowing how to study. Perhaps, yeah. But it was also me doing the wrong career and studying the wrong thing. So then you do have that, that you actually get the nicest stories rather than someone like, yeah, I'm studying this because my father wants me to study this, so please help me. Was that your situation or...? Um, yes and no. So my situation was when I was 16, I wanted, so my sister is an economist, economist. she's uh, 40 now, something like that, and she's like 15 years older than me and she was successful working at the bank and my father came from a really low income family and my father, my grandfather was a plumber and my grandmother stayed at home. They lived by, and then my fa but my father had to start working when he was like 14, 13, which in Uruguay you don't really do unless you have to. Yeah. And then when I said I wanted to become an architect, which was some idea that came to my head, my parents said like, no, you cannot make money in that or you're going to really struggle with that. And then I said, okay, I'm going to be a, do personal training, become a, because I like sports back then. I was like, no, you're not going to make money from that. Okay, I'll just do economics. Okay, yeah, that's good. Because my sister did economics. Yeah. And then when I turned 18, I was like, yeah, I don't want to do economics. I'm going to do international relationships. And my father was like, you're going to hate that, but just do whatever you want. You're already 18. So I went there. I did six months. And that was the worst six months <laughs> studying. Yeah. It was just pure law. Yeah. And I hated it. In Uruguay? In Uruguay. Okay, yeah. Since I'm 12, I always thought that I wanted to move abroad. Um, so then that also played a little bit of an influence. I knew that Uruguay was not my country. And then when uh, 18 and a few months, I quit that study. I said, okay, I'll go to economics. I started failing every class for the first year. I did one year and I thought, oh, I think it's because my parents just got divorced and I'm not really enjoying It's a class of 500 students and I'm just by myself because my friends started six months before. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the same courses. So then I moved to the Netherlands and yeah. did economics. So you were 19. I was 20 when I moved, yeah. yeah. I did economics. First year, I almost didn't make it through my BSA. Yeah. So basically that's when you need to get 70% of the courses. I got 70% on like the penalties. Okay. And then I was like, I have my backup plan. I have like, oh, I'm gonna study marketing or do this or that. And looking back, I think I should have. But in the end, I continued with economics and then I went on to work. I finished economics because, yeah, some cost fallacy already did two years. Might as well do the last one. Yeah. In the end, there was always like this pressure of just continue going, which I just fell in a cycle. And it was not until actually last year that I had a burnout from working and actually not being happy with what I was doing that it just shifted everything in my head. And it was like, yeah, what am I doing? And I always thought it was the company that I was working for, that I work in a small company, that was a problem. Work in a big company, private, that was a problem. I worked in a public, oh, that's also the problem. Then I went to a family business, and it was not until I went to the family business that I realized, 
I tried everything there is, I think I'm the problem. But that whole process took me eight years to realize. Mm -hmm. When I think it could have been faster if I would have had a little bit more support and a little bit more thought behind of what I've studied and what I did. Do you think it will be here without all the experience of the last eight years? And that's also my other side. I wouldn't be where I'm at right now if I wasn't because of that. I wouldn't be, I don't regret anything. I don't regret anything of it. But behind the back of my head, there's always like, I should have studied marketing or I should have studied something a little bit more creative, communications that would have got me more where my passion is. Mm -hmm. But then it's, yeah, I studied finance. I have a master in finance, that background. And I'm here right now sitting because of that. And the other thing, I can still learn it by myself. I can still learn how to do it. Yeah. But it took me eight years when something that perhaps it could have taken me, perhaps 10 even, if you consider 18 when I made my first decision. The thing is like, we can't change the past, right? Yeah. So we can say, I should have, I should have. But I think more important is like, what can I do today? If I'm aware of, I'm not happy with the situation where I'm in right now, you can make a conscious choice yeah. about making the change. The, I think the... Uh, problem and the challenge is how we are how our parents uh, educate us and, and our upbringing like if you always hear that this is not going to make you a living this is not going to make you happy this is not going to work for you what are you going to believe yeah. exactly so it's a whole process and this is only mindset work because you can physically rewire the structure of your brain and change it because your brain probably says, okay, I need to do economics to, to earn money. I need to do that. I need to do that. Like everyone tells me. And now you, you found something, you hit that wall where you uh, got the burnout. And then it's like, okay, why is that? And then we can say, yeah, I should have, I should have, but we can't change that. But now you're in this position where you can say like, okay, I can, every day I can make a choice whether I'm doing what I enjoy or if I'm doing something because I'm doing what other people expect of me. Yeah. And if you continue with the road, like I will do what everyone expects of me, you might end up again in the unhappy situation. If you're going to figure out like, am I doing what I enjoy, which could also be building houses and nursing. <laughs> yeah. Um, then you'll probably be satisfied and you're like, I'm so happy that I did this this class or this course you know a guy actually that we used to play rugby together and he studied tax law worked one year and a half and after working one year and a half he was like why am i, I hate this and then he went on to become a construction worker so he's actually building houses so that's a fun example yeah. but you mentioned the systems so you fall into this there's systems to break that mindset yeah how would you go because for me it took me a burnout and yeah. i don't recommend that on anyone uh, no but the other hand is indeed like how can we prevent a burnout like i it's it's a super complex uh, concept um and i think i often also work so much and i don't see results that lead me into the headaches the sleepless nights the self doubt the considering whether what i'm doing is the right thing etc and then I really have to consciously take breaks before I maybe fall into a serious burnout, to say so. Um, on the other hand, what are the systems? I think it's indeed, first of all, doing what you love. Because uh, one of my mentors, he phrased that burnout as you're not doing too much. You're doing too little of the things that you like. Instagram, I think that this week I'm not. I did. Uh, it's um, and I think that's that's very interesting, right? So if you ask yourself, like, am I doing enough of the things that I like? I often experience myself when I'm in those situations where I'm like tired, headaches, etc. In those weeks, I did indeed didn't go to the gym, I didn't play soccer, I didn't ride my motorbike, I didn't see my friends that much, and it's like, oh yeah, I didn't do these. So I need to start doing them again. Um, and on the other hand, it's like 
it's hard for me to like, talk about these systems because I haven't experienced something like that myself. But it's more like, okay, what can we do? Find more balance between life, social activities, self-care activities. Uh, but on the other hand, I strongly believe that magic happens when we're pushing ourselves also. So it's like, okay, we can push ourselves for quite a while, get extreme cool results. But if we then hit that wall, we also need to know how to take care of ourselves, which is super difficult. Like I'm still struggling with that myself. Well, you say you're, you cannot really talk about that, but you can talk about the side of preventing. Because how you say, you, if you realize, oh, I didn't go to the gym or I didn't journal, I don't know if you journal or I didn't see my friends. If you do, don't, don't do those things in a consistent basis, then you realize, okay, I'm getting into a rut. I'm a feeling that I'm not feeling myself. Yeah. So you can talk about that part and help prevent others with that yeah so right? far that's yeah. what i try to do like i also they say to my students like if you're studying for six days take one all day off yeah. and don't do anything and then they'll say i feel guilty and i'll say it's not necessary because instead of you cramming the whole last week we've now been preparing for almost six weeks so i'm pretty confident that you got this sorted but it's new to them yeah. and then it's like oh yeah okay i'll take a day off and do some fun activities. So the first year for me on my bachelor was really tough. Yeah. Also because of moving abroad and hard winter, etc. But then towards the second year, I passed a little more courses. And I think it was not until the last year that they didn't fail any course. And I actually did on one semester. It was either doing one whole extra year or doing nine courses in one semester when the usual is four. And... I actually passed everything without doing any resets. It was the first time ever I didn't have any resets and I passed everything. And I think the one thing that helped me was I never studied the day of the exam or the day before the exam for that course. I always studied two months uh, behind back. Mm -hmm. And I also took a lot of breaks in sports. So I would go at seven to the university, seven, I think it was seven when it opened, eight, sorry, at eight to the university and be there until seven. So it was a lot of hours, but then after seven, I would get home and just do whatever I wanted. Yeah. How, what, what are, my, this backstory goes into, what are some of the proven techniques that you are actually recommending your students to do into studying and learning and not burning out yeah. actually, and getting good grades? Yeah. I think uh, I always say there's three things. The first thing is indeed knowing why you're doing what you're doing, such that you have indeed the intrinsic motivation that it's you who decided that you are doing the studies, etc. Like we, we had a whole talk about that later, but there should be some kind of intrinsic motiv motivation um, and the mindset should be in the right place. The second would indeed be the, the learning methods. Um, I will keep this short because I can go fully in depth for this for like half an hour, but... Uh, there's one thing we call spaced repetition, which is, well, you probably heard your teachers or your parents say, you have to start early and repeat, but uh, they never explain you why or how. So basically what science has found is that on average, uh, after one hour, you forget about 30% of new information. After one day, 60%, and after one week, already 80%. So if you don't repeat on these increments, for example, the same day, one day later, one week later, you're trying to recover like 80% of your course in the week prior to the exam, which is almost impossible. You have a lot of workloads. Uh, therefore, a lot of students don't have this overview. They have the stress because it's too much. Yeah, because you didn't keep up for like the past 10 weeks, let's say. But that doesn't mean that you have to study uh, one or two hours every day, we then implement methods that we call active recalling. So if you're learning anything, I would always recommend you to get into active recalling, which means that you always learn by asking yourself questions. All right. So if you read a book about, let's say, productivity, and I'm asking you, hey, can you explain to me time blocking? And then that is a question and you're going to try to explain the concept of time blocking as if I were uh, your student. That is one way. 
but everything is about not passively reading, not passively watching material, but actively recalling uh, or coming up with the information that you're studying. And if you implement those three, like the mindset, the spatial repetition, and the the active recalling methods, like there's almost no op uh, possibility that you'll sail. Like almost, almost no. That would see it all too. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, sport and activity, physical activity in general, plays a huge role. A lot of science has found that after moderate to uh, intense uh, sports your focus and concentration boosts for two to three hours after that activity. And why is that? Is because basically when you're sitting still the whole day, well, of course you're, um, you're not, your body is not that active. So what happens when we start to do a physical activity, the blood flow in our body increases. Therefore also we get more blood and oxygen into our brain. And this stimulates the hippocampus and that is a part of our brain responsible for memorization, focus, and learning. So actually by doing physical activity, you reactivate this part of the brain and a lot of more processes, um, which help you to focus and concentrate better. So I always advise my students to go for a small walk, 30 minutes, do exercise, go to the gym, do your workouts, and then get back into studying because it's super beneficial. What about the rule study? When we will study in yeah, that's a good question. Depends on how you approach it. If you are, I was, you would just talk. Yeah. So I'm quite of a lone wolf, I would say. Everything I do, I prefer to do it myself because I know I can handle my distractions. Exam content. If, I, yeah, but I, I know like I do the preparation, I outsource it, you know? If I'm, in a, working in a cafe, working at a, after a, a live event, I can't do that. I'm always talking with people, I'm networking, I'm interacting. So I know for myself, I study best when I'm at home, alone. I can put my phone away, I can put the distractions away and just put in the work. But a lot of people think they are more productive when they study together. Well. It would be a cool research. Like, hey, do you study more productively when you're in, in, in groups? Yeah. Um, but it could be beneficial if you're actually, indeed, doing a group discussion about the material. Yeah. If you are going to pretend that if I'm, I will teach you finance, for example, I'll teach you how to calculate the ROI. Yeah. Uh, and then it becomes productive because you're actively recalling information. You're teaching it yeah. and that will help you. Yeah, you mentioned that of um, studying by yourself or going studying at home. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of students that live in student houses or fraternity houses, and then they have the problem of yeah, hey, let's go have a beer, and then oh, I'm studying. But then you have the library, and the library, there's always like this peer pressure of not even grabbing your phone just because you feel that you're being seen or judged or... The body doubling effect is that. What is it? Can you tell me about that? It's basically that if I see you work, I'm more uh, leaned into working as well. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. So then for those people, library works the best, but for some others, they don't, they're able to block and yeah, I'm studying and then they just don't do anything else and they are able to focus no matter where. Yeah. How, why is that? That's a good question. question. I don't have an answer to that one. I'm going to be honest. I think it's preferences. Um, I've all, like I said, I've always been someone who studies alone or works alone. Like you can put me in a room, give me a laptop and I will do the work. Boom. How do you come up with your content ideas? Actually, how do you know I want to teach about this or I want to teach about that? Do you use? Chat GPT? Do you see what other people are doing? Do you just say, I want to do this and teach it, and then you find a way to teach it? Yeah, good question. Okay, so long story short, first of all, you just teach what you know. So basically the, the background is, okay, I know about all these methods. I know about the things that worked for me, and I'm going to teach that. I started with spoken videos, so talk to camera posts. 
they got quite some engagement, um, but didn't work. So also within content, we started to switch like, okay, we can still provide them uh, and explain them how, for example, the study method of mind maps work. But when I speak to the camera, I only get, I only, I get 10,000 views, for example. Uh, but when we do it in a short real format, five to seven second video, we can get up to 100,000, 200,000 views and a lot of comments. Yeah. So that is uh, some shifts that we make. But basically what we do is indeed, um, I look at what my students need. So basically, okay, like this is a conversation I had with someone last week. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, feels like I need to create more content about that. Sometimes what I do indeed is like, okay, uh, ChatGPT is like, okay, I, I'm a study coach. I teach my students about scientifically proven learning method, active recalling methods, mindset, blah, 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 blah. Give me like five content IDs or 50. And then I'm going to see like, oh yeah, I really haven't thought about that. Maybe we can create something with this. And then I look at what other creators uh, use, what kind of real format or content format they use do they use carousels for certain topics do they use reels for certain topics and then we just kind of like mash everything together with my personal story the things that we teach and then the things that my students actually ask me throughout the week but it's nine out of ten times the same conversation so you say we and that's you and your content manage your team yeah yeah, so basically we're with a, a, a social media manager, a video editor, and uh, another business partner. And mainly I do all the research on the content because I understand the material the best. So it's like, okay, if I want to teach something like this, I can ask my social media manager to create it or to share something, but, but she has no idea whether it's right or wrong. So that is something like we're still kind of explore, exploring, figuring out, but so far that works. That works for us. Yep. Yeah. So for your the um, uh, his name is Tim. He is uh, still working at ABN uh, Amro, a full time uh, job in in banking, and uh, he helps me out on the side, like pretty early in the. A stage of the business he contacted me and he said oh I think this is a really cool idea it sounds amazing I would love to help you out by the way we met on our university so on our masters we never got the chance to work together also due to COVID etc but um, we always clicked so I was like okay let's let's just do this start weekly meetings see how we move forward and now Tim is more leaning towards the part of the business where it's responsible for the advertisements, uh, the social media strategy indeed. So we're continuously figuring out like, hey, what are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? What am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? And then see if we can separate the task. So he's more on the systems side at the, at the moment where I'm more on the coaching, uh, acquisition, sales, etc. Do you, you mention uh, advertising, advertising as in outside? So you advertise your company or companies reaching out to advertise on, let's say, your social media? No, I mean, like, we advertise. Like, we run Instagram ads and Facebook ads just since two two months now. Yeah. Have companies reached out to you to do partnerships? Every day. Why not doing a partnership? Or First of all, like how many times do you buy from an affiliate from like a social media influencer who promotes a certain thing? If the deal is good, so for example, music licensing, I've done it. Cause yeah. I know I get like a 50% on a one year subscription. Yeah. I've also have some content creator friends. And if I buy something from Amazon, I go to their link. So then they get an affiliate. Exactly. Yeah. But a lot of times, I think for example, when I was studying, I did search for Grammarly because I needed for my thesis to correct it and plagiarism and stuff. And I did get like a one or two months subscription for like one euro, something mm -hmm. like that. So I did do it, but it's not that I do it as often. Like I'm not someone who wants to have my whole Instagram full with all of these promotions of AI apps or 
uh, templates or anything like they reach out for for everything and i i'm like hey i have my own company right so what i want to promote is my own uh, services my own business and if you want to promote anything we can do that but not on my main instagram page so we have all these like communities and uh, programs on the background where also students are involved. So I'm more than happy to promote your product or service there, but not where on my main page. That's just not what I want. Referring to, for example, these AI companies, products that perhaps you don't use. Yeah. Perhaps you use Notion, for example, just saying a brand, or you use Google Docs. What if a company like that, or why not reaching out to a company like that and saying, hey, I have this social media, let's do a deal or something. And then they pay you to promote something that you're actually... Act yeah. If I would use it, yeah. But you don't use it. <laughs> yeah. But I I don't use all those tools. Like if I promote something, I want to make sure that it's valuable and it's going to help my students. And I've been uh, indeed, like I think 10 different AI tools have reached out to me and say like, yeah, could you create a reel? And then I'm like, yeah, well, I can do that, but you pay me a thousand bucks and I'm not going to post it on my Instagram. I'm going to post it here. And why do I not do the affiliate link? Because I don't believe that, well, I'm going to get more than, than students to, to sign up. So it takes me time. It takes me um, also the credibility. Like if you're continuously promoting all these other things, like exactly. So it's like, uh, but it must be hard to say no to. No. Nah. No, it's just like, okay, I don't do that. Just don't react to the emails. No, I say I don't do that, or you can indeed pay me quite a significant amount. What if they say yes? Well, then I create it and I'll post it on these other platforms. I'm, I will never post it on my social media, on my Instagram account. Basically, your account is just for your own business and it will always be for your own business. Interesting. I find that quite, what's the word, proud? or like honest, yeah, proud and honest, in the sense that I do see other, for example, study coaches promoting products that perhaps you think, are you really using this? Like you graduated, I don't know, thousand years ago, and are, are you really using this company now? And staying actually true to yourself is good, and you can are able to sleep on, at night, I think, and you're not feeling like a sellout. Exactly. Like, uh, I would rather feel like a seller trying to help m my students actually with what we're doing than with also promoting things that I don't personally use. So, well, ha like, if we are talking about are you an influencer, I don't like to call myself that because I'm, I just try to educate people. So I changed it to what I'm an influencer, educational influencer. And that's what I try to do. I don't try to influence you to buy something I try, oh I do try to influence you to educate yourself on certain topics so it's I think different when you when you started this company or when you were perhaps one year and a half ago when you were thinking of starting this yeah. would you have imagined to be where you are right now no. what, was what was your, your thought, thought back then? then no I thought I had a good idea so I knew like, okay, with the study systems and the things that I'm teaching, I do have a good idea. I need to validate it. So that's when I did all these interviews and the conversations also with my network. They also said like, you have a good idea. Like, I think there's a lot of students needing this information. That gave me the confidence. And then it was like, okay, now I need to find a way to sell this knowledge and the service I first thought of me just going to do um, guest lectures at universities but then I figured that was a pain in the ass to go through the whole that process and then I found this other way of like hey you can teach people one-on-one -on -one. and I was like okay that's what I did on on, um, on the sports science bachelor already um, I was on the same school as uh, as your wife I would say now um, and we had this concept where in the fourth year, you would be a student coach for first year students. And I did that. I had 30 students. And then I thought, okay, now I just graduated. I have a lot more knowledge. Instead of just doing that to 30 students here, I will do it for myself and start my business around it. 
and that's when it kind of like started. What do you think they will do? Well, for my students, all right. My goal is always to teach them as much as possible in the amount of time that we work together, such that they will benefit from it their whole life, like it did for me. And those are indeed the mindset shifts, the learning shifts, the time management shifts, and the belief in themselves that they are capable of a lot more than they believe uh, initially when we start working together. And and I think that gives me the biggest fulfillment to see them succeed and them being like, whoa, I never thought this was possible and this is amazing. And then that they continue with that mindset and go with the rest of their life and be like, those three months or those six months with Tom, they changed my life. You mentioned earlier that you have students from 13, 14 years old to 59 years old. Mm -hmm. What does someone that is, for example, not in the educational system anymore? Let me rephrase. What's the approach that you take for someone that is not trying to get grades and study because they need to pass an exam mm -hmm. to someone that is already working and 50 years old with kids? Yeah. Yeah, the first question is, uh, why are you doing what you're doing? And then they say like, oh yeah, I want to just get more knowledge on the topic of, let's say I have someone in this situation, um, uh, food and diets and stuff like that. So I ask like, okay, why do you want to get more knowledge on that? And they'll be like, yeah, it's for myself and a lot of friends are interested in it so I can help them out. Okay, so we get somewhere. Why do you want to help them out? Yeah, because I think it's valuable to educate. You get the point. And I asked this question first like seven times. Like, why do you want this? Why do you want this? Why do you want this? And usually we eventually come to an answer where it's like, oh yeah, I might want to also get paid for helping people with this dieting thing. I'm like, okay, perfect. So now we have a real motivation for you to do this course where it's self-study, you need to motivate yourself, but we're going to keep that end goal in mind. Like, where do you want to move to what? And indeed... That is self-paced education, so it's a lot harder to really put yourself into sitting down and studying. Uh, but on the other hand, with the yeah, the normal stu students, it's like, okay, when is your deadline or when is your exam? Why are you doing this course? What do you want to get out of it afterwards? Um, and I have people indeed like 18, they're like, yeah, I want to work in the sea uh, with uh, sea animals and stuff like that. They have this whole idea and therefore they are doing these studies. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, keep that in mind. Like if you don't pass these exams, that goal, that future is going to be one or two years away, like extra away. So, so there is continuous education and there's actually people that want to learn to learn past their educational phase, let's say. The majority of my students actually are more mature. Um, the more students I have in my free courses are the youngest. Hmm. Is that because of their economical situation? Yeah. Purely. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I have students that are 20, 18, that can also pay for the uh, high ticket services. Um, but the majority of the younger students, they, they don't have that budget. So we help them as much as possible on the, on the lower or free resources. Yeah. Do you see that a lot of parents reach out to you for their kids? Uh, yeah, actually today, before I drove here, uh, a dad texted me, he saw my advertisement on Instagram and he was like, I'm reaching out for my 18 year old son. He probably failed his A levels. So we want to help him, but we don't know how. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of parents reaching out. The thing is, and this is interesting. I only want to work together with students who are motivated by themselves. If the parent says you have to do this because you need to pass and the students say, nah, I don't want to do this because I want to do something else. I'm not going to collaborate because it decreases my chance of success and their chance of success. It's like, okay, I'm not, they, they always say you can drag a horse to the water, but you can't force it to drink. And if this kid is the horse that I need to pull towards the water 
and he's not going to drink, like I'm putting in all this time and effort for, for what? Yeah, for nothing. For the money, actually. That's it, but that's yeah, not Yeah, but that us. doesn't give me the yeah. fulfillment. Like, no, I want indeed. this kid to succeed. So, if someone wants to, like, hire you, yeah. they go into your Instagram or website, and then they book a call with you, or they reach out by email, or there's always a call with you yeah. at a certain point. Yeah. And then you find out about the motivation. Exactly. So, process is fairly simple. People reach out on Instagram, on WhatsApp, on whatever platform. We book indeed a call, free consultation call, because I want to see if it's a good fit for us to work together. Uh, usually 45 to 60 minutes, we talk about their challenges, what the problems are, also where they want to go. And then I share with them like, hey, I think you're a good fit for our group program, which, uh, which is with, for example, 20 people. This is, uh, I think you're a better fit for my one-on-one -on -one coaching. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I'm talking to students aged 28, 29, who are learning about a topic because they want to start their own business and therefore want to educate themselves more. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, I can't teach that in a group program because it's quite specific. Yeah. And if they are like, yeah, I don't have the financial resources or anything like that, I'm like, okay, we also have this other option where you only pay like 30, 50 bucks a month, but you still get access to all, to me, to the live co uh, calls, to courses. So that is really valuable um, for the free uh, thing. No, that all happens like automatically. I'm not going to hop on calls with 700, 800 people to see if they are good for a free course. It's like, no, just, just take just, it. Just how do you filter out the people that are actually interested in paying mm -hmm for the high level ticket, let's say, yeah. to someone that just wants to have a call and pick your brain. This is one of the biggest challenges that we're still figuring out to this day. And even, especially with the growth on Instagram, because a bit of background information in November 2023, we had 6,000 followers. In February 2024, we had 200,000. So we grew with 140K in three months time and then indeed figuring out who is like a qualified and to say so qualified and who might not be qualified is extremely difficult because we were getting hundreds of DMs per day yeah. and we were answering them manually and it's like okay tell me a bit more about yourself where do you live how old are you like what universities are you in etc so basically what we now do is we created a couple buckets and this is based on, uh, indeed, location, where people are located, and uh, indeed, age, age group. So if they are above 18, living in Europe or America, we know that buying power is higher. So we uh, tend to uh, get them in our high ticket programs um, because those are my cash cows, to say so. Like they generate money such that we can provide cheaper courses but like some people say like oh yeah but you should aim to help everyone right because that's your philosophy yeah i can only do that if i have 10 people paying for example 800 euros a month otherwise i i can't do anything um and then we have the buckets indeed everybody else could go into our low ticket program which is 30 to 50 bucks a month and we can always upsell them if they're really serious if they don't even have 30 bucks, like I created this free course material where I believe like, okay, if you watch this, you can implement this and you can still succeed. That is my idea behind it. And I do monthly life coaching. So they still have live access to me. Um, and that's how I try to kind of also live up to the, yeah, of, to, of my, how do I phrase this? Of my goal of helping as many people as possible because that's what i want and i believe if you help people the money will come from itself what's the cost of running something like this actually what do you mean like the yeah monetary yeah monetary monthly cost um uh i have editor social media manager and uh, systems like the school groups that we run uh the subscriptions that we have for the crm everything like that we're now at 1500 a month. So that's, that, that's I think, still okay. The bigger we grow, 
the bigger your subscriptions become. Like if you're eventually talking about like a million leads per month, for example, then you need to buy these higher yeah. subscriptions. Yeah, you need the systems it. also to exactly. be able to handle that. Yeah, you're probably going to pay for a CRM like 250 or 300 a month to make sure that all these leads are covered. But right now, 1,500-ish. Mm. Yeah. Do you still study a lot yourself? I would say I'm learning continuously about the things that I'm teaching. So if a student asks me a question and I'm not entirely sure, I will dive into YouTube. I will uh, find an article or find some content about it. I will study it. I will try to explain it the next time to the student because that's the way I learn the best. And then I've learned it. So sometimes students ask me like, do you know about this? I'll research it and then implement it. Yeah. What are three books that you would recommend? For a student, I would recommend the one thing. So this is a book about productivity, uh, about time blocking, about not multitasking, about how to make sure, well, that is all in place. I would say the second one would be Level Up from Rob Dial from The Mindset Mentor. Why this book is all about indeed first starting with your mindset, figuring out why you're doing what you're doing. Then it also combines uh, information about why people procrastinate. So it teaches you a lot about the five reasons people procrastinate. It's usually because they are afraid of something, fear of failure, a fear of not being good enough, a fear of success actually, all that. So I think that's very valuable insight. And the third one, Mm. that would be an interesting one there's so many books that I've read over the last year but one that I personally just enjoy a lot because of the content that is in it is Think and Grow Rich I'm not sure if you read it it's I think the number one self-improvement book um, I would say read that once next year read it again I read it twice now in a year time and next year I'm going to read it again because every time a lot of things like fall into their place. What is one piece of advice that you received that you would like to share with the audience? Yeah, I think this one, and I, I hear this still on a daily and weekly basis. The 10 words that ruin most people's life is that they care too much about what will other people think and what will other people say. And if we start caring less about those two things, we are going to well, achieve a lot more. If I would care too much about what other people would think when I started creating content and starting this coaching thing, I wouldn't be here. Tom, where can people find you if they're interested in you? Oh, on Instagram at the study coach, uh, the underscore study coach. Uh, and our website is going live in probably a month or two. So that will be tomsteam.nl.